welcoming uh, Grace and Sasha from Cousin Cloud Academy and very honored to have later on join us uh, Dr. Silverman uh, as part of the team. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce the first speaker and um, uh, Simona is, is really uh, very well known uh, for her work in fetal cardiology and she's a director of pediatric cardiology and congenital heart disease program, Institute Dante Pazanetsi do Cardiologa, I think I, saw, I pronounced it correctly, San Paulo, Brazil. Um, the talk is 25 minutes, uh, so you're most welcome, uh, Simona. Thank you, I'm gonna share my uh, presentation. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the opportunity to participate in this video episode of From the Congenital Heart Academy with my partners, Vanessa and Daniela. And my talk today is on echocardiographic evaluation of hypoplastic left heart syndrome in fetal life. Hypopla hypoplastic left heart syndrome is a constellation of left-sided heart defects including mitral, mitral valve abnormalities, left ventricular hypoplasia, aortic valve abnormalities, and ACNA aorta hypoplasia. It represents between 4 and 8% of all congenital heart defects and is present in 2.6 uh, to 10,000 There please. are multiple levels of Sorry. evidence that point to a genetic predisposition to the development of the disease. Yes. Any problem? Um, uh, just uh, wanted, could this screen be bigger? Are you uh, viewing it? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Is it yeah, okay? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Should yeah. I start again? Please do, yes. I'm sorry. Thank the opportunity to participate in this video episode of From the Congenital Heart Academy with my partners, Vanessa and Daniela. And my talk today is on echocardiographic evaluation of hypoplastic left heart syndrome in fetal life. Hypo hypoplastic left heart syndrome is a constellation of left-sided heart defects, including mitral, mitral valve abnormalities, left ventricular hypoplasia, aortic valve abnormalities, and ACNA aorta hypoplasia. It represents between 4 and 8% of all congenital heart defects and is present in 2.6 per 10,000 births. There are multiple levels of evidence that point to a genetic predisposition to the development of the disease, including higher recurrence risk of congenital heart disease, disease and hypoplastic in other family members of patients diagnosed with the disease. Possible anatomic and functional etiologies are posterior deviation of septum prime and restricted foramen of valley that lead to uh, left, uh, low flow to left chambers. In this transthoracic echo, we can see the, devi uh, the posterior deviation of the septum prime uh, as pointed here with the arrow. Another well-known condition that can culminate with hypoplastic left heart syndrome and or uh, hypoplastic left chambers and aorta is critical fetal AS, um, presented in the first and second trimesters of the gestation. Um, the most important echocardiographic markers of impending hypoplastic left heart syndrome are moderate to moderate LV systolic dysfunction, retrograde aortic arch flow, and abnormal flow at the foramen ovale with left to right flow. Achieving biventricular circulation without fetal aortic valvuloplasty in the setting is rare. The goals of prenatal imaging in hypoplastic left heart syndrome are delineate the anatomy and physiology, risk stratification, prognosis, clinical decision-making and possible pre and postnatal intervention and parental counseling. Uh, for that, the following topics will be approached systematically. 
Simona, it, there, there are actually... some examples of hypoplastic left heart syndrome on the left side hand. I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry. Simona, they're asking if the images could be bigger. Are you doing it on full screen? Yes, I am. Okay, it's coming too small here on, uh, on our, oh, our... Okay, should I present? Uh, uh, I can, can do it live, okay? Oh, that would be better because you have beautiful okay. images, yeah. Okay, I'm so sorry, I I'll start again. No, we, we are so sorry, but we want people to really uh, enjoy your talk. Okay, okay, don't worry. So um, let me um, stop sharing. Um, can stop sharing and I'll, I'll PowerPoint. Oh my gosh, where is it? Um, what's going on? Um, does Vanessa want to start and I can uh, work on this here? If you want to continue the way it was, that's fine. That's fine. No problem. Uh, we don't want to create trouble. No, uh, but no, I would be happy to have all the pictures seen. So I don't know why. Uh, but if Vanessa uh, could start and I'll, I'll work on this and, and. Sure, sure. Okay. Sure. Would you Vanessa. mind? Vanessa? No, no, okay. So uh, just just uh, make sure, uh, we wanna make sure that everyone uh, enjoys uh, uh, the talk. So um, we're so sorry for uh, this uh, unintended delay, but I think this is for the sake of the viewers. And I'm also honored to present our second speaker now as the first speaker, uh, for Vanessa Kanutu. And her, the title of her talk is Congenital Heart Disease and Fetal Growth Restriction. Vanessa is medical staff at Fetal, a Pediatric and Other Congenital Heart Disease Echo uh, Lab at the Institute of uh, Dante uh, Pazanesi do Cardiolaga, I think, uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, please proceed, Vanessa. Okay, I'll share my screen. Hi, thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in this webinar with a, such a wonderful group like the Congenital Heart Academy. Thank you very much. I have no disclosures. So, according to American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists, fetal growth restriction is one of the most common and complex problems in modern obstetrics. It occurs between 3 and 10% of pregnancies. It is defined as the fetal weight below the 10th percentile or two standard deviations for the gestational age with a higher risk below the fifth or the third percentile. It is important to point out that 50 to 70% of fetal growth restrictions are compatible with parents' height and ethnicity. So the best definition would be the fetal growth below potential is the difference between the expectation and the reality. The diagnosis of fetal growth restriction and small gestational age are confused with each other. Of course, it is clear that the vast majority of uh, those uh, fetal small gestational, the vast majority of restricted fetuses are small for gestational age, but there are those small for gestational age that are not that are not restricted, like uh, such as small constitutional ones and fetuses with adequate weight 
that are not are, are actually restricted because they are not growing according their potential. So, does the diagnosis of fetal growth restriction apply to fetals with small gestational age with Doppler abnormalities? And what is then observed that even small gestational age fetals with normal Doppler uh, may be associated with placental and cardiovascular alteration. But what is the impact of fetal growth restriction? The morbidity of a, a small gestational age newborn is five-fold higher than if of an appropriate gestational one. And the morbidity is even greater if it is small gestational age preterm. The morbidity is asphyxia, meconium aspiration syndrome, respiratory failure, hypoglycemia, hyperthermia, pulmonary hemorrhage. And the mortality is eight-fold higher in small gestational age compared to appropriate for gestational age. It occurs in 9.7 to 100 births with prenatal diagnosis and in 19.8 to 1,000 births without prenatal diagnosis. This graph demonstrates the perinatal morbidity and mortality according to birth weight percentile by gestational age. Note the increase in both morbidity and mortality from the 10th percentile with a very significant increase from the 5th and 3rd percentile. The fetal growth restriction classification depends on the one set. In the first trimester of pregnancy, fetal growth occurs to, due to cell hyperplasia. In the third trimester, fetal growth occurs to, due to hypertrophy. And in the second trimester, would be an intermediate phase between hyperplasia and hypertrophy. So, when the insult occurs in the early pregnancy, there is a reduction in the absolute number of cells with symmetrical fetal growth. And if the insult occurs in the late pregnancy, there will be an asymmetrical growth with a predominance of head growth in relation to the rest of the body. The fetal, late fetal growth restriction corresponds to 75% of cases and placental insufficiency is the main cause. 10 to 20% are early fetal growth restriction with main genetic cause, congenital infections, drug use, and ionizing radiation. And another 10% are restrictions in the intermediate phase with malnutrition, smoking, alcoholism, and drug use as main cause. And the greater risk for fetal malformations, uh, including congenital heart disease, occurs in the early restriction between three and nine weeks of gestation. The cause and risk factors for fetal growth restriction can be subdivided into placental, fetal, environmental, and maternal factors, highlighting the single umbilical artery uh, of uh, placental uh, factors with an incidence of 15% of fetal growth restriction. Fetal infections, multiple pregnancies, 20% of fetal growth restriction among Jacaronic twins, and 30% uh, in Monocorionic twins. Stress, addictions, anxiety, the disease of the century, and the hypertension uh, as the main cause of maternal factors. Uh, 30 to 40 percent of incidence of fetal growth restrictions among hypertensive pregnant women. Despite all these possibilities, 40 percent of fetal growth restriction cases have unknown cause. Some important data: 10 per, uh, fetal growth restriction is observed in 10 percent of fetus with the gen genetic alterations or congenital malformations. And if this alteration is chromosomal, especially trisomy, triploidias, Turner, and mosaicisms, the incidence is 38%. Children with congenital heart disease are 1.8 to 3.6 fold more likely to have been 
preterm or small for gestational age. And children with important congenital anomalies were restricted in 22% of the case, with the severity of the malformation proportional to the fetal group restriction. The most associated uh, congenital heart disease were tetralogy of fallow, hypoplasic cleft heart syndrome, pulmonar valve stenosis, and ventricular septal defect. This is studied publishing pediatrics in 2007 with a very significant number of case and controls, more than 700 in total, demonstrated 15% of incidence of fetal growth restriction or small gestational age among patients with congenital heart disease versus 7.8% in the control group without uh, significant differences between types of congenital heart disease. For the diagnosis, uh, an adequate measurement of the gestational age is necessary through the date of last period, especially if the gestational age is in concordance with an early obstetric scan or the uterine height and, and the fetal wave evaluated by biometric and some body proportions. Uh, these are images for evaluation fetal biometers, biometry. This is the biparietal diameter, head circumference, abdominal circumference, and femur length. And what about the relationship between fetal growth restriction and congenital heart disease? There are two opposite cause-effect lines in interpretation. In one direction, the congenital heart disease changes fetal circulation, and this could cause the fetal growth restriction. In the opposite direction, because of the fetal growth restrictions, there is a reduction in supply of, the, of, of oxygen and nutrients, which changes the fetal circulation. And this could be the anatomic substrate for the development of congenital heart disease. Regarding the pathophysiology of cardiovascular involvement of the growth restriction, placental insufficiency offers less oxygen and nutrients, which redistributes blood flow to noble, or noble organs, such as the brain, the heart, and the adrenal glands. This is, uh, this is the centralization. This distribution is reflected in vasodilation, which is called brain sparing, and in coronary vasodilation, it also occurs, and it is called heart sparing. On the other hand, placental insufficiency increases the impedance of umbilical arteries. So the flow of the umbilical arteries to the placenta is slowed, which increases the systemic vascular resistance and consequently the cardiac afterglow. And this is reflected in an increase of central venous pressure and in a reduction of the flow of the ductus venosus. So, the end of the pathophysiology is the pulsatility of umbilical vein. These are videos of a case of heart sparing. This is the three vessels in trachea view. This is pulmonar artery, aorta, and SVC. And you can see a huge flow from coronary artery. This is another case of heart sparing. Note the huge flow of both left and right coronary arteries. Also, we can see even coronary flow in the myocardial periphery. In this another video, we can see this ceiling flow from the aortic arch to the brain territory. It is important to, important to emphasize the importance of the ductus venosus flow. It reflects the impairment of the right ventricle. Uh, so the Doppler tracing changes with the increase of the right ventricular pressure. Specifically regarding, regarding myocardial involvement, the placental resistance causes peripheral vasoconstriction and increased peripheral vascular resistance 
cardiac afterload, and consequently, ventricular hypertrophy, diastolic dysfunction, an increase of the T index, and in the end, vasodilation. This is a restricted fetus with myocardial hypertrophy, dilatation, and dysfunction. Still regarding the myocardial impairment, the high afterload reduces the velocity of the ventricular outflow tract, but cardiac output is maintained with preserved preserve, uh, Jackson fraction. If cardiac output is the product of the stroke volume and heart rate, and if the stroke volume is reduced because of the lower velocities of the outflow tracks, then cardiac output is maintained because of an increase of heart rate. Uh, the cardiac output, uh, even it can, it can even increase in the first days of life because of the sustained higher heart rate. If there is a low uh, absolute cell numbers, the myocytes become deranged, which can increase the ventricular repolarization time and cause electrical instability. This is important about some drugs that act in this electrical interval time. And the restricted fetus is always trying to save energy. So the parasympathetic system is activated to reduce the heart variability. It's the calm fetus. The activation of the parasympathetic system is related to cardiovascular disease in adult life. This is a historic study that evaluated adults with coronary heart disease in relation to several variables uh, since birth. And it tabled the weight is in pounds, and I put uh, in the side the corresponding kilo, kilograms. Note that the lower the birth weight, even the weight at one age of year, the, uh, the higher rate of deaths from coronary heart disease uh, before 65 years of age and at all ages. Another point. If the low supply of oxygen and nutrients, this low supply of oxygen and nutrients because of the fetal growth restrictions, makes metabolic and hormonal readaptations with the aim of increasing energy reserves. One of the outcomes is the increase of the insulin, insulin resistance that will have repercussions in adult life. Another table from the study I cited earlier shows worse glucose uh, tolerance values, the lower the birth weight. Another important point is the catch-up growth in which small for gestational age babies reach the weighted height percentiles for age up to two years of age. But this excessive weight gain in early childhood is also related to cardiovascular disease in adulthood. Observe in these graphs, how was the gain of weight, height, and body mass index between boys and girls diagnosed with cardiovascular disease as adults? Zero is the mean value, so, he, so see how they overcame the average with time. So fetal growth restriction uh, reduce nutrients, reduce the absolute numbers of cells, uh, makes a redistribution of cell types, changes fetal circulation, have changes in metabolic activity, uh, thickening of the vascular intimal layer, and the long-term cardiovascular disease would be hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, coronaropathies, diabetes, stroke, obesity, and others problems like low intellectual performance, low stature. Finally, this is the aspect of the obese tradition during the prenatal follow-up of a case of fetal growth restriction. At delivery, this is the relationship between the obstetrician and the neonatologist. And now, how behave the pediatric cardiologist? Thank you very, very much.
Thank you so much. And um, uh, really, really very interesting uh, uh, talk. Um, um, and uh, if, if, if uh, Vanessa, I just have uh, one or two questions and then we, we see if we have any questions. And I hope uh, by the time uh, um, Simone is ready, First, would like to congratulate Dr. Silverman is not coming because it's Thanksgiving in the in North America. So, would like to congratulate uh, our our fellow uh, friends there and um, and and thank you so much uh, for um, Brazil Group to 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 come today. Now, um, the interesting you said fetal growth restriction is parallel to um, small for gestational age. Is this correct? Yes, yes. Yeah, correct. Yes. And then we know that there is uh, also early and late SGA, so the symmetrical or unsymmetrical, which is also interesting. Yeah, I mean, you said that the early ones, they have cell hyperplasia and the later ones, they have hypertrophy. I just yes. wanted to understand this, please, if possible. Is this okay. at the cellular level? Uh, what, what gestation or what, when does this happen? Well, and the end of the, well, in the first of the pregnancy, the first trimester, uh, decrease the number, the absolute numbers of cells. And in the, the end of the pregnancy, these cells makes hypertrophy. But if you, uh, the fetus has a uh, fetus growth restriction, uh, the body works for the main organs like brain. So the brain continues to grow and the other parts of the fetus don't grow as well as the same the, of the brain. So the baby has a bigger uh, head and lower uh, abdominal circumference uh, because it's the fat tissue. Uh, this is what, what happens, it's a little different. So if the insult occurs in the third trimester, you have the absolute numbers of cells, it's okay, but only the cells of the brain and, and the, the heart, for example, will grow, will do the hypertrophy, and the others will uh, still uh, are, will, will become thin. And after birth, the baby can reach that. So in general, the, the SGA uh, uh, early in gestation are the symmetrical ones. And so this will be, uh, from your point of view, it will be hyperplasia of the cells while the asymmetrical ones, which is in late gestation, they will show hypertrophy at different uh, areas of the body, right? About the abdomen, not the brain, not the, not the head and so on. Uh, uh, thank you so much and, and it's important. The okay. second question is the correlation with the SGA or FGR and, and my coronary, coronary compensation. So is this with everyone, the beautiful coronaries that you've shown, is this with every, um, case of uh, you have we have to look for that for uh, for uh, in uh, SGAs or FGRs we have to look for coronaries and we will no. see uh, this this case were in the end of the physiopathology it's a very very restricted fetus so at first uh, it uh, increased the vas vascular resistance the uh, cardiac afterload and the venous pressure uh, central venous pressures reduce the ductus venous, in, in, though it's a, it's a line you have to, it's a very large way to reach that start to, uh, for the uh, coronary compromise. Yes, but we know it, coronary is, is terminal, but, but is uh, this what you were showing, a fetus with a, a, a fetal growth restriction, only no congenital heart? And yet the coronaries were, 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 were dying uh, with no congenital heart, just the coronaries? Uh, yeah, because uh, the, the vasodilation of the coronary. So you see a lot of flow in the coronary. And if we, pediatric cardiologists or fetal cardiologists, don't know another case that not congenital heart disease, we don't understand why the coronary arteries, uh, the flow is this way. So we try to see a fistula, another congenital heart defect, but, uh, and maybe uh, these two cases, we didn't know about the fetal growth restriction uh, just after that, the, another obstetric scans that could see the gestational aging, the birth weight. So it's important for us to understand that this can happen uh, uh, in other situations, not only for congenital heart disease. 
Thank you so much. It's a very important point. Uh, please allow me to introduce our uh, uh, second and first speaker, Dr. Simona Pedra. Simona, are you ready? And as we presented before, she's a director of pediatric cardiology and congenital heart disease program in, in the same institute in San Paulo. Simona, Hello. are we there? Yeah. yeah. Can you see Thank my, you. my yeah, Yes, beautiful. See Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's start again. Um, so I'd like to thank the opportunity to partic participate in this video episode and, um, and especially with my partners, Vanessa Canuto, who did a very good talk now, and Daniela. And my talk today will be uh, on hypo uh, echocardiographic evaluation of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So hypoplastic left heart syndrome is a constellation of left-sided uh, heart defects, including mitral valve abnormalities, left ventricular hypoplasia, aortic valve abnormalities, and ascending aortic uh, hypoplasia. And it represents between 4 to 8% of all congenital heart defects and is present in 2.6 per 10,000 births. There are multiple levels of evidence that point to a genetic predisposition to developing hypoplastic left heart syndrome, including a higher recurrence risk of congenital heart disease and hypoplasts in other family members or patients diagnosed with, diagnosed with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Um, possible anatomic and functional etiologies for the development of the disease are posterior deviation of the septum prime, or restricted foramen ovale that lead to low flow to the left chambers. Um, in this transthoracic echo, let me just go back here, uh, we can appreciate uh, the posterior deviation of the septum prime in a case of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Another well-known condition that can culminate in hypoplastic left heart syndrome is um, um, critical fetal AS, aortic stenosis, presented in the first and second trimesters of gestation. The most important um, echocardiographic markers of impending like hypoplastic left heart syndrome are moderate, to, uh, moderate uh, LV systolic dysfunction, recurrent aortic arch flow, and abnormal foramen ovale flow inverted from the left to the right, and achieving biventricular circula circulation without fetal aortic valvuloplasty in this setting is rare. The goal of prenatal imaging in hypoplastic left heart syndrome are delineate the anatomy and physiology, risk stratification, prognosis, clinical decision making, making and possible pre and postnatal intervention, and parietal counseling. For that, the following topics will be uh, discussed systematically. These are some examples of fetal uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Uh, um, here on the left side, uh, left hand side, a case with uh, mitral and aortic atresia, no LV is seen. And on the right side, a small LV cavity in a case of patent mitral valve and aortic atresia. In this setting, findings of coronary to LV fistula is uh, very frequent. This is a case of hypoplastic left heart syndrome that one was, once was a critical AS, and we can see a tiny flow across the aortic valve, a smallish LV, EFE, and severe systolic LV dysfunction. Moderate to severe tricuspid valve regurgitation or RV dysfunction are unusual. And if present, they are more related to ischemia, either because of coronary artery fistulas or restricted retrograde aortic arch, arch flow. Pulmonary valve abnormalities are rare, but if present, they are very significant considering the postnatal management. RV systolic function can be evaluating, uh, evaluated uh, uh, using employing the usual parameters like K index, myocardial strain, tissue Doppler, um, but more frequently uh, eyeballing the eyeballing method. 
And systolic parameters tend to, to, uh, tend to have worse values, uh, values compared with the normal fetuses. Moving to interatrial septum evaluation, the usual presentation is mild to moderate restrictive ASD. Um, however, critical restrictive ASD may be present in six to 20% of the cases. It is usually well tolerated in utero, but can have a, a severe clinical impact uh, postnatally. Besides looking at the ASD size and flow across it, um, um, restrictive a a ASD presents with dilated left atrium, pulmonary vein, and assessing the pulmonary vein flow is mandatory. And when integrate to a reversal VTI ratio is equal or less than five, it, it is considered restricted. These are two cases of hypoplastic left heart syndrome with good size interatrial communication, as you can see here, no left atrial dilation. With good flow when assessed with the color Doppler and a nice pulmonary vein tracing with insignificant reversal flow. Differently, here we can see a dilated left atrium and pulmonary veins, very little flow across the septum and very abnormal pulmonary vein doppler with a VTA ratio of one. In this slide, we appreciate the proposed algorithm for serial examination of fetuses with suspected restrictive um, atrial septum defect. The high risk group for emergent uh, atrial septostomy, neonatal septostomy in this study is the, the one when VTA ratio is equal or lower than three. These other art author, uh, besides VTI ratio equal or below 2.7 for predicting, predicting severe neonatal illness uh, included when it is greater than 2.7, the measurement of the pulmon pulmonary vein diameter. And when it is greater than 3.8 millimeters, it is also a um, high risk group for severe neonatal illness. This is another case of our experience where restrictive ASD led to mitral uh, valve annulus dilation and severe MR. Mind the very pathologic flow, uh, venous flow on the bottom left side. One day after fetal aortic septostomy, uh, uh, septostomy, MR decreased significantly, but a severe TR of, uh, occurred due to acute RV overload. There was a significant improvement on the pulmonary vein flow, as you can see here. Ascending aorta can be assessed from a fetal long axis view projection, like you see here, very uh, thin ascending aorta, another case here. And on the three vessel view with various degrees of aortic hypoplasia, as you see two different examples here. These are some examples of different sizes uh, in sending aorta. On the left side, a very well developed one. And on the right, a severe hypoplastic ascending aorta with retrograde flow across it. Moving to the aortic arch, here we can appreciate a very well developed aortic arch in, a, in the setting of hypoplastic left heart syndrome with unrestricted uh, reversal flow. And the three vessel and trachea view also allows a nice appreciation of the aortic arch with retrograde flow, as we can see here in these two uh, examples. Sometimes bizarre anatomy like this one may be identified with restrictive retrograde flow to the ascending aorta. 
Note the high velocity and pathologic flow in the isthmus with significant impact on the RV systolic function. In this slide, we can appreciate the postnatal CT scan, CT scan uh, with identical finding of the fetal web. Associated lesions may be, may be part of the presentation. Total anomalous pulmonary vein return is one of the most frequent. And a nice hint to its suspicion is the larger distance between the left atrium and the descending aorta with a vascular st structure between them. In this specific case, the vertical vein was uh, stenotic, demonstrated here by the high velocity color flow. Here we see the vertical vein, the inanimate vein, and the SPC. Many parameters have been identified as predictors of neonated biventricular circulation of, after aortic valvuloplasty for critical aortic stenosis, including left, left ventricle size, capacity to generate pressure, aortic diameter, and LV inflow time. And the higher chances were encountered in groups where the LV, the capacity to generate pressure LV was greater than 47 millimeters of mercury and the ascending aorta Z score greater than 0 0.57. However, parameters that predict a, a hypoplastic chamber may grow after any type of intervention have not been yet identified. Uh, I'd like to present two cases to discuss this topic. Case one, just a two, 24, uh, 27 weeks gestation, preferred for fetal echo because uh, chambers disproportion, RV much greater than LV, diagnosis of quartation of the aorta with borderline LV. And here we can see the four chamber view, the chamber does disproportion, and the outflow tract, um, and you see the septum, um, uh, the, the septum priming bulges a little bit to the right, and a severe quartation with hypoplastic uh, aortic arch and retrograde flow across it. These are the left structures measurements, ascending aorta Z score of minus two, aortic valve annulus of minus 0.46, mitral valve annulus of minus 5.46, LV and short, uh, LV long and short axis of minus 0.6. And the question is, does hyperoxygenation have a role in this scenario? Three weeks later, same findings, but almost closed for MNO Valley, as we see here. 10 minutes after hyperoxygenation, eight liters per minute, uh, increased pulmonary vein return was uh, observed and the uh, interatrial septum was bulging to the right side. She performed uh, about um, three weeks of therapeutic hyperoxygenation. And the baby was born at 39 weeks gestation, but although LV seemed quite good on size, uh, signs of severe pulmonary edema and a bizarre ventricular arrhythmia led us to uh, an atrial septostomy a few days after a hybrid palliation. And some days after the procedure, the septostomy, the LV showed to be unprepared to deal with the systemic circulation and the case followed the univentricular tract. Case two is the first gestation, 26 weeks and hypoplastic LV with severe LV dysfunction, diffuse EFE, hypoplastic mitral valve and aortic valve and a tiny aortic and integrate flow. Fetal aortic valvuloplasty was performed one week later 
you can see the balloon being inflated across the aortic valve, a very difficult case because of the size of the LV. And two weeks later, after, um, uh, after the procedure, uh, at 29 weeks gestation, uh, mitral and aortic valves uh, were moving much better. There was an excellent integrate flow across the ascending aorta, and there was a slight improvement on LV function uh, as we see here. A neonatal hybrid was performed, and during the following months, LV uh, and uh, function and size significant improve, improved, as we see here. Biventricular repair was obtained at 12 months of age. This is the uh, intraoperative TE immediately after uh, uh, off pump. And there was a hybrid takedown, aortic valve of alveoplasty and EFE removal. And this is his echocardiogram at five years of age. He is now nine years old and in excellent, excellent clinical status. And with this, I finish my presentation with the, finding, uh, with the following final comments. Fetal echo allows detailed delineation of the anatomy underlying physiology in hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Uh, fetal and immediate, immediate uh, neonatal intervention may be tricked off based on refined echocardiographic information. A systematized, a systematized examination allows the assessment of essential elements for this purpose. Therapeutic insights in cases with borderline hypoplastic LV and well-formed aortic and, aortic and mitral valves have to be considered after careful examination and family counseling. Thank you uh, very much, and I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you, Simona. Beautiful talk um, and, and very informative. And uh, your message here, if I understand, is that don't rush to say this will be univentricular repair. Is this correct? And what will you uh, encourage? In, I mean, what are the encouraging signs? You said if the a, antenatally, it's not LV, for, the LV is not apex forming. So how, what will be a reassuring sign to say, okay, um, there is a chance that it could be biventricular. What will be the parameters that in, in your point of view? Okay, first of all, the first question, um, don't brush. This is the message, yeah. Um, sometimes we can be surprised with the uh, outcome of uh, hypoplastic or borderline uh, LVs. So um, any insight in possible therapeutic approach may be um, uh, employed and uh, have a, a biventricular repair later on. Uh, regarding the, the other um, question, I think it's very important to look not only on size, but the myocardium. Um, um, Sometimes you see it's all also uh, uh, all EFE, and there is no uh, no hope with this LV. Um, of course, we have you need a, a, a well formed mitral valve. Sometimes it's high; uh, it's it's different. It's difficult to differentiate because um, when you have a critical yes, you have a very uh, high end diastolic pressure. And the mitral, mitral valve don't move, don't move very well, uh, doesn't move. Uh, but I think uh, you need to have a well-formed LV, although uh, smallish, uh, like uh, right, mitral valve, aortic valve, LVOT, and some myocardium. Um, I think generation of pressure is, is important. And these are the most important things, I think. So any numbers, like if you say the mitral should be this core around this, aortic should be this core around this, the, the, uh, the length of the LV should be around, this is hopeful or not hopeful. Any numbers for the audience to just keep in mind or when they read reports to know, okay, there is a chance from this fetal echo, it might improve uh, just to, to spread the knowledge of interpretation of the fetal echo findings. Yeah, so um, 
you know, we have now uh, many studies about um, critical AS in, uh, during second trimester parameters and uh, the possibility of um, biventricular repair in the neonatal period. But numbers for a, a, a hypoplastic chamber uh, that can improve, we don't have. We don't have. That we know that there are numbers that they would go for biventricular, irventricular, or we can say, okay, let's try a seno. And then the, the surgeons nowadays don't rush postnatally to do biventricular. Most of them wanted to give a chance for a yes. biventricular or one and a half. And my, my, my second question, which I enjoyed uh, listening to, is the RV dysfunction, your interpretation of RV dysfunction. Do you put two factors of RV dysfunction? One is fistulae and, and uh, the other one is ischemia. Could you please let us know more about that? What is the evidence yeah. of that? Yeah, so we have to remind the physiology of hypoplastic left heart syndrome that the flow that um, um, uh, the perfusion of the myocardial comes from the retrograde aortic, aortic arch flow. If you have any restriction at this uh, point, and sometimes you have bizarre, or sometimes you have more critical quartation, um, um, there is a restriction of flow to the head and to the myocardium. And these are the, the worst cases and the high risk cases for RV dysfunction, and usually uh, uh, accompanied by. Uh, TR, fricosyl regurgitation. So I think um, we, any time I have a hypoplast uh, with um, some, some uh, kind of RV dysfunction, I look very carefully and I, I search for coronary fistulas and it's usually present when you have a patent mitral valve and aortic atresia. And more um, frequently, um, if you have any any restriction, and usually when it happens is uh, on an isthmus um, that restricts the flow to the um, aortic arch, ascending aorta, and myocardium. So if you, if you see trichosmic regurgitation antenatally in a fetal echo, with a, with a, what well, it looks like a hypoplastic LV. And so you are, when you counsel, you think it, the, the fetus might not make it till term? Were they like uh, postnatally, the, they used to refuse uh, um, um, norwards with the tricuspid regurgitations, but nowadays it's not a, a contraindication. But we go into the fetal life. If we see tricuspid regurgitation, is this like um, a warning that this baby, this fetus might not make it to term? Yeah, uh, not to term. They usually go to term un unless it's very critical, especially the TR but it's a very high risk neonate. And another very important uh, thing, um, because we work a lot with not only, uh, mainly with hybrids when possible. Um, I think a very high risk, risk patient for the hybrid um, uh, tract is when you have quartation. Because if you have quartation, a significant quartation, uh, you can't uh, keep this, this type of circulation. And you know, the hybrid procedure is a, a procedure that um, um, simulates the fetal circulation. So if you have a quartation or evidence of uh, flow restriction, this is not a good candidate for a hybrid procedure. And I'd have to refer it for a, a Norwood procedure. Um, because you need to, uh, to um, operate on and um, uh, um, yeah. perform the surgery. Okay? Especially that the hybrid can cause, the stent can cause uh, coarctation. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly, exactly. When you put the stent on, there is a, always a risk for um, restrictive uh, retrograde flow. So, uh, you have to, to, to keep in mind that if it's, it is prenatally restrictive, it's not, it's not a good candidate for this, this type of procedure. Also, I have lots of questions. I don't have any questions uh, from the audience so far, uh, but the, the first one you've done uh, intervention. So what is the, and yet it went into 
uh, univertricular. So what's the message there? The first one, yeah. So this is this was a very interesting case. And uh, when I saw uh, this case, um, uh, I thought he, he was going to make as a biventricular circulation. And I think that one of the, the main problems here for the uh, LV hypoplasia was of restrictive uh, atroceptin um, uh, foramen ovale with uh, not very um, good flow to the left chambers. So um, I tried to do some hyperoxygenation to improve the LV um, preload with more pulmonary vein uh, flow. Uh, but besides, um, it increased with the preload stimulation, um, the physiology was not good. Um, there was something, uh, there was a pressure uh, uh, at the uh, um, ventricular septum that was bulging to the, to the right. And there was a bizarre uh, ventricular tachycardia in this patient. It was very hard to, to get rid of it. And um, he didn't tolerate uh, because the feeling pressures to the left heart were very high. So this was a tricky case. And at the end, we had to open the, the uh, atrial septum and you see how the, the LV shrinked. Um, but the aortic valve and the mitral valve were very well formed. So it was a, a pity to, to uh, abdicate of a biventricular circulation in this case, but... Um, the myocardium was not ready. You, you want to say that the LV myocardium was not ready, although the, the, uh, the, the aortic and the mitral were ready, but the myocardium per se was sick. Maybe, Antinatally yeah. and postnatally, it could not. Now for the audience, uh, the, um, the hyperoxygenation test is still not a standard way of... Uh, of, of, of treating or, or, or um, dealing with fetal pulmonary hypertension or thoughts of fetal pulmonary hypertension. Could you tell us how did you do it and, and, you, and how often was the protocol for this lady? I, I can see that she was delivered at 39 weeks. I mean, she was doing probably okay. So what was the protocol for her with the, with the maternal hypervaccination test? So we started with, uh, with the test, test and we assessed um, the fetal artery, uh, pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein dopplers. And of course, the cerebral circulation, placental circulation. And, and we saw some improvement on, um, venous, on pulmonary venous return. So we attempt uh, at night, every night uh, with um, um, eight liters per minute with a mask uh, and during the day she was doing uh, her work uh, for three weeks and she came back and I didn't see any um, real improvement on the circulation and the RV was big and, um, and we stopped and we decided that it wouldn't, wouldn't work. Um, and then we just waited for her and she delivered the baby at 39 weeks. Uh, this was a very difficult case to deal with. Um, we did a hybrid procedure first because we, we really expected that sometimes she would, uh, this baby would be okay for a biventricular circulation. But mm -hmm. after decompressing the atrial septum, mm -hmm. we decided that was not, uh, uh, able to that. Um, now she, this baby has uh, this baby has a pulmonary vein stenosis, left pulmonary vein stenosis uh, that was treated with uh, stent implantation surgery, and now he has a super glean. He has uh, he has underwent uh, after the hybrid a Norwood procedure, and then um, gland plus the RV to, pulmonary, to left pulmonary artery conduit uh, and a bending between the pulmonary arteries to improve the LV, the left uh, artery flow because of the left veins uh, obstruction. 
Oh, wow, that's a complex case. That's a very complex case. He's doing but great, very smart. He has a lot of plumbing in his heart. But the, the message, do you recommend this uh, hyperoxygenation? I mean, what made you think of it? Eight liters is quite a lot uh, to sleep with eight liters, a mask of eight liters. And I know that uh, Dr. Huta used that's to do it four problem. liters mm -hmm. and for 20 or 30 minutes and then measure the PI for pulmonary pre and post. But that's you're doing the PIs for everything and uh, giving her eight liters is this something you'd like to do uh, for other babies, for other fetuses, you think it, it might work? Because a lot of people think it might work. Yeah, there is some um, um, data on this, this topic. And there was a, um, uh, um, some, some trials. Uh, the, the first one who pub published was Thomas Cole. And and some of the, the studies show that there is benefit to try to improve the LV size in some settings of mild hypoplasia. So uh, if I think there is a chance um, of improving the, the LV size and function, uh, I try. But it's not, uh, it, it's just few cases. I've been using uh, hyperoxygenation as a, a uh, diagnostic tool in some uh, situations like um, um, atrial septum aneurysm. It's very nice because sometimes you have patients preferred because of LV hypoplasia and you, you do the test and then you see that after eight minutes, you 10 minutes, the, the septum bulges to the right side and the, the filling of the chambers improve. So it's nice to differentiate differentiate from a problem, a real problem and through an aneurysm and other settings. So I use it much more as a diagnostic tool, not a therapeutic, but I tried in this case, I had I had the hope that we, we would have a, a biventricular circulation, but it didn't happen. And do you measure the PIs before and after the oxygen? Is it of value to you? of the pulmonary artery? Yes, yes, you, you, you have to, to do the PI. You, you have feel improvement, is there improvement after the oxygenation that the flow, but I would expect it, that the PI will change with the oxygen if the flow increases in the left ventricle. Yeah, so you, you, you show, you see uh, the, there is a better uh, increase in the um, pulmonary artery flow and then um, velocity and uh, VTI um, numbers improve, increase in the pulmonary vein and mitral valve uh, flow and aortic flow. Uh, and That's beautiful. I think more, you know, more striking is how you see the uh, flow. The, you're, the you're, flow. You're happy yeah. with the flow. The, 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 the yeah, gushing, yeah. The gush of blood in everything, the but when you look at it and you say, oh, this is feeling better. And you showed so, that in the, in the fetal echo that the flow was, uh, oh, yes. it was beautiful. Thank you so much. And uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. Thank you so much, Dr. Pedra. Uh, and Thanks. it's uh, my pleasure to present our last speaker for the day. And this is Daniela Kreutzig um, Lego. Uh, she's a medical staff at Fetal Pediatric and Other Congenital Heart Disease uh, Ecolab in the same institution. And her talk will be Interesting Cases in Fetal Life. Thank you so much. Please proceed. It's a pleasure to join the Congenital Heart Academy with this fetal series. I'm going to show you two interesting cases that I've learned a lot and I'd like to share with you. I have no disclosures. First case, it's a 25 year old woman with 32 weeks. She had one loss with 21 weeks with no proper investigation. She didn't know about congenital heart disease and she was referred due to chamber disproportion. So here is her fetal exam with 32 weeks and this four chamber view. There is right chamber enlargement, also a redundant foramen valve with no signs of restriction. The left side structures were smaller and the 
area between the left atrium and the aorta was increased. Here again, a uh, four chamber view uh, with no color. This area is increased. We couldn't see the pulmonary veins connection to the left atrium. And with a low scale to detect low velocity flow, we could see this venous confluence behind the left atrium. And in this video, we can see the zygous vein connected to the superior vena cava. Again, this flow behind the left atrium was this low velocity, but we really couldn't see where it was connected. With the Doppler, we could see it was continuous flow. Here is a three vessel view with the anterior movement of the transducer to see the nominate vein with the normal size. The aorta had, uh, it was smaller than the pulmonary artery. Here is a bicaval view with superior vena cava, right atrium, and inferior vena cava. With color, we didn't see any abnormal flow connected to these structures. And here is the ductal arch with the low scale to see this area behind the left atrium again. We thought it was a venous confluence a pulmonary vein confluence behind the left atrium, but we really couldn't detect where it was connected. So at this time, we thought about total anomalous pulmonary venous connection with obstruction in the pathway. She did a C-section with 38 weeks. The baby was a female weighing three kilos with Good APGA scores. Soon she had respiratory distress and deep cyanosis. She was intubated and sent to the ICU. Here is her x rays. We can see uh, reticular opacities in the lungs without cardiomegaly, also uh, pneumothorax. It was prompt drainage, as you can see in the second picture. She did an echo, but with a poor acoustic window due to the pneumothorax. But it's worth noting that the foramen ovale was shunting right to left. There was a large PBA also with a right to left shunt. Signs of pulmonary hypertension, absence of pulmonary veins entering the LA. And a trivial vein flow posterior to the left atrium, but we couldn't define the connection. So she went to the cat lab. As you can see in these parameters, we confirmed the pulmonary hypertension. And in the videos, we can see the contrast and the pulmonary artery and aorta by the ductus. And in the prolonged level phase, the retention of the contrast in the vascular bed, there is no pulmonary veins entering the left atrium, but the retention of the contrast in the pulmonary vascular bed. Here is a technique with digital subtraction angiography. Here is the right pulmonary artery with contrast and in the prolonged level phase, the retention of the contrast and the pulmonary vascular bed. And it couldn't see a confluence, a vein confluence and 
they thought there were some lymphatics draining to the superior vena cava. So now we thought about common pulmonary vein atresia. There was no viable operative repair. We did some multidisciplinary discussion and we decided to withdraw care. She died shortly after and with no autopsy. Well, about common pulmonary vein atresia, it's rare. The incidence is based on autopsy. And in this entity, the common pulmonary vein is obliterated late in the de development, while in the total anomalous pulmonary venous return, it is early. So in this disease, there is inability of collaterals to form, and it is progressive. It's a poor prognosis, and it's usually fatal and survival depends on the presence of a sizable venous confluence. ECHO is a screening tool. You really need to do a CT or a CAT, and autopsy is recommended. Uh, I thought this case was really interesting, and I will consider this entity next time. Well, my second case, it's a 31-year-old woman. It's her first pregnancy. She's healthy. And she was referred to Simone for a remote consulting with 29 weeks. She had, the baby had pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum. And she was referred for fetal intervention evaluations, but the uh, right ventricle, uh, ventricle had normal size, so it was not recommended. And we advised her to come to Sao Paulo around 35 weeks for delivery attempt at term. But I will show you her exam with 35 weeks. Here is a four chamber view. As you can see, it's a giant right atrium with a right ventricle with hypertrophy. The tricuspid valve has abnormalities with tethering, and it's the baby has hydropsy. It's there is pleural effusion pericardial effusion and ascites, as you can see here too. With color, we can see an important tricuspid regurgitation with right ventricle pressure elevated, a jet with velocity of almost five meters per second. Here in a short axis view, we can see some movement of the leaflets of the pulmonary valve, but with color, we couldn't see an interrogative flow. And there was a reverse flow from the ductus from the aorta to the pulmonary artery and also pericardial effusion. And these videos are really amazing. Here is the right atrium, giant right atrium. Here is the liver, a small left atrium and a really small foramen of all. And with, with color, there is a restricted, restricted flow from the right to left. Here we can see the pulmonary artery with the good branches and the ductus. With color, we can see a reverse flow from the aorta 
to the pulmonary artery. And in this Doppler, we can see in the venous ductus uh, E wave, reverse E wave, and in the umbilical vein, there is pulsatile Doppler. So this baby was in a big trouble. It was not just a pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum, but also with the restrictive foramen valve and with hydropsy. So she went on an emergency C-section with 35 weeks. The baby was a female weighing 2.5 kilos with good after scores, but she was intubated and went on prostaglandin. And she was sent to the cat lab to do echo and intervention. Here is her first exam immediately after birth, a subcostal view. There is restriction of the Roman valve with right to left churned with a mean gradient of six. She did a Ruskin procedure, as you can see in this video, guided by echo. Here is a four chamber view with this right atrium enlargement, the right ventricular hypertrophy, some tethering of the leaflets of the tricuspid valve. With color, you can see um, an important regurgitation and with a jet and a right ventricle pressure of 94. And as you can do some anterior movement, you can see the pulmonary valve. It was imperforated. There is no anterior flow, but we can see the reverse flow from the ductus. And here is the angiography. First one, you can see the right ventricle with the right outflow tract and the unperforated valve, it was perforated and dilated. And here is the final result with no residual restriction, but with some um, regurgitation. And this baby, they tried to suspend, uh, discontinue the prostaglandin for three times, but they, she didn't tolerate. And she was with low set, so she need another procedure with 13 days of life. And she went to another cat to put a stent in the ductus, as you can see here. And here is the final result. And I'm going to show you her last echo before discharge with 28 days of life. Here is a subcostal view. Here we can see an interatrial septal defect of 3.7 millimeters with bidirectional flow with no re restriction. A four chamber view. There is some right atrial enlargement, but it is really smaller. The tricuspid valve has some tethering and mild regurgitation. The tricuspid valve has normal Z-score. And it has 11 millimeters of diameter. The right ventricle has good systolic function and signs of the diastolic dysfunction. In this picture, we can see the mild regurgitation 
of the tricuspid valve. There is biphasic flow and the pressure, right ventricle pressure of 36. And here, there is, we can see the aorta and the pulmonary valve with the lifted leaflets with movements. There is residual, a small obstruction and the gradient of 17 with a mild regurgitation and a vigorous contraction of the outflow, outflow tract. And at last, here is the aorta, the pulmonary artery, and the stent and the ductus with a flow from the aorta to the pulmonary artery with, with um, restriction and a gradient of 74. The pulmonary arteries has, have good size and based on this case, we thought a lot. And I'd like to tell you something. First, pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum and restrictive peroneal valve can cause hydropsy. Based on this case, we thought a lot and we really consider fetal intervention in this scenario, even with good sized RV. Early birth can be necessary, gently relieved by cat to avoid circular shunt, carefully clinical and echocardiography monitoring and determining optim optimal timing for ductal stenting. It's the success of therapy. This baby is now at home. She was discharged with a set of 92, is doing well. And it was very interesting. And I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to participate of this fetal series. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Beautiful cases, well done. And, uh, and really, uh, I, I learned a lot. I uh, just wanted to ask you also for the audience, um, I like uh, the take home message to say gentle and to avoid circular shunt. Can you tell us more about that, please? Well, uh, first of all, you want to, to relieve the restriction in the peroneal valley. We don't want a, a big hole, but to force the flow through the, the right ventricle and pulmonary artery. Also, you want to relieve the pulmonary obstruction, but if you have uh, a, an important regurgitation and a big ductus, you can cause circular shunt. And we a steel, is it like a steel phenomenon, yes. right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, Simone, uh, I'd like to, to um, do you have any questions for, uh, for uh, um, um, our, our, our presenter or uh, Vanessa or Simona, do you have questions? No, no. Um, I was here to help uh, Dani uh, if she needed some help, but I think she did a great job. Um, and we worked together in this case and these two cases. Um, but I'm happy to, to help if there is any other question. I was wondering about the cardiac function, uh, uh, Simona. I mean, the function, I don't think it was okay in utero. And, uh, uh, and uh, maybe, I mean, looking at the um, specific anatomical problems, if we could correlate, uh, why do we have restriction in the septum if we have an uh, um, unrestricted tricuspid valve? And... Um, and the pulmonary arteries were really good size. So there was flow early on in gestation and then something happened. So is it function that really um, uh, caused this uh, problem in utero to, 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 to make things look like that, like a development of lesions secondary to poor function or poor function secondary to the lesions? Which one started first? Or maybe you don't think the function yeah. was, was abnormal yet? 
No, I think it was abnormal. And the thing is, if you have pulmonary atresia and tax septum, it usually usually have uh, RV systolic dysfunction too, because um, it's there is a, an obstruction uh, up front. Um, in this case, uh, specifically, uh, you see very well developed uh, um, pulmonary valve annulus, uh, pulmonary trunk, pulmonary arteries. I thought it was functional at some stage, and, but when you said that it was ballooned, uh, so it was not functional. Yeah, uh, I think I think it's anatomic and consequence of an anatomic uh, obstruction. Um, and this case, this case, besides the the pulmonary atresia, there was a very restrictive ASD. So I was consulted, uh, as Danny mentioned, uh, when she was twenty nine weeks. Uh, I didn't see her because she was in the north of, of our country. But someone sent me some images. And um, there was no diagnosis of uh, atrial septal restriction. So when I looked at the RV, I said, no, we don't usually open this kind of valve, valve, this valve when the RV is nice. I think she will be biventricular at birth. And I recommended to uh, do serial uh, examination there and come back, come to, to Sao Paulo because the, uh, the, the city she lives doesn't have interventional cardiology and come and I'll see you at 35 weeks and we prepare you to delivery. And I was so surprised. She was the late, uh, the later case uh, at my private clinic. And I was looking at that and then we decided to do the C-section right away because I was very worried about any kind of uh, tachycardia and the baby would die because very hydropic. And, and then we planned, Carlos was with me and we discussed and so let's uh, take her uh, immediately after birth to the cat lab, open uh, the, the ASD gen very gently as, as Danny mentioned and then we proceed with the valve opening and we tried to avoid the stent implantation, but she didn't uh, manage to, to, to have a good oxygenation without uh, an additional sort of, of flow. So, uh, but I think it was very interesting. And I, I, I talked to Vanessa and said, let's, let's show this case. We have always to mind the, um, and remember that the ASD can be uh, restrictive. With a severe TR, this baby is going to be hydropic. Do you know why it was it restrictive uh, antenatally? Any, any idea why it was restrictive? It's not common, right? To see this. No, it's very uncommon. And you know, we've been working a lot with pulmonary atresia in utero. And I think it's the one, the first one that I see with very restrictive uh, presentation. So it's uncommon. Usually the, the, the septum prime is aneurysmatical in this setting and the uh, right atrium, um, uh, like uh, it, it, the space is good, but this is this, more this tense and very, restric very restrictive. Uh, and I think the message is um, when you start looking at a, um, a case with high drops in, in the setting, you have to think about the, the interatrial septum uh, immediately and try to, to get good pictures of it because this is the cause of the high drops. Um, it's not very usual to have high drops in this setting unless the atrial septum doesn't decompress the right atrium to the left side. Simona, you've done three procedures for this baby. Um, and which one you think really put this baby um, to, the, to the best uh, uh, outcome? You've done septostomy, you've done valvoplasty, you've done stenting, I think, of the PDA. Um, which one, or did they, because you've done it in sequence, and it's a very learning objective here that you try to remove the, to remove the pressure on the right, right heart in the, the, the tricuspid valve is a bit dysplastic, and then you do the pulmonary valvoplasty, still not maintaining saturation, and then you do the ducts, and then everything improves. So what is no. the lesson here? 
Yeah, uh, you have to think about the, uh, the first thing, uh, septostomy and pulmonary valve uh, and uh, valvuloplasty were done in the same procedure. At the same, yeah, thing. yeah. Uh, at the same time, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so we thought that she she was very sick uh, because of this huge left uh, right atrium, and we said let let's re relieve a little bit of the RV uh, right atrium pressure, and she can uh, uh, decompress the right atrium, and then. Uh, open the valve. So uh, this uh, right ventricle was decompressed, or this right atrium was decompressed by two two sides, to the right, to okay. the left, and yeah. and, and, uh, uh, and, and yeah. Yeah. So and we have to, of course, we have to think about the future. So I need this. This ventricle has has to work in the future uh, by itself. Um, so, but we didn't want to do the, the stents in the same procedure because she was too, uh, two sick. kilos oh. and she was too sick. She had pleural fusion, she had, uh, ascites, she had pericardial fusion. So, and she was small. And when you put a stent in a ductus with integrate flow, you may overload uh, the lungs, so you have to be very caref careful, like choosing the size of the, the stand you are using. So we decided to um, make her better, as you said, uh, before, immediately after birth, and she improved significantly. We didn't drain the thorax, we didn't drain the pericardium, everything went very smooth, and after three three turns, three times trying to um, 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 taking the prostaglandin, prostaglandin off, she didn't tolerate. She would do uh, low sets and then reintroduced and then she was well already. She was doing well. Let's take her to the cat, cat lab again and give her some source, another source, source of pulmonary flow. So, I think it's a combination of procedures. Yeah, I think it's it's a nice case. That takes us to uh, Vanessa. This is a SGA, was it? Or a full-term SGA with complex congenital heart disease. Um, I, I, she's two kilos and she's full-term, right? So she's just more- No, no, she was, she was, she was uh, premature. Yeah, oh, she, okay. she, oh, she was 35. 35, 35. Oh, wow. So Two as, as Vanessa, kilos. yeah, Vanessa, you, you put uh, on the table uh, the incidence of, of uh, higher incidence with congenital heart disease of prematurity and SGA. So this case proves that indirectly or directly, right? Yes, because congenital heart disease is one of the major cause of FGAR in the first trimester. So, yes. So um, I just want to thank you all and wish you a very new year. Can I ask further elaboration on the deviated septum primum in the uh, lecture on hypofloss from Jason? Jason is asking uh, Simona. I, she wanted to know. He, he wanted to know uh, about the uh, deviation of the septum as it part of the etiology, possible etiology of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Ah, okay. The deviation of the septum primum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, um, it's it's um, one of the theories that may support, that may be supported by uh, flow makes the organ function, but very, very early in, in gestation uh, during the embryo phase, uh, it's not, it doesn't happen um, uh, during gestation, I would say, or during. So these cases, when you have a posterior deviation of the septum prime, Usually you, you have the, the constellation of aortic and mitral atresia, and usually you hardly see any LV. Um, so I, I believe that uh, it's, it's very, er, very early in gestation that uh, will take um, the case to the, the hypoplastic chambers, hypoplastic uh, left heart syndrome. Um, um, Simona, you also sense? said that there's 20 percent chance of uh, of uh, restriction in hypoplastic left heart syndrome, right? So is this so it could be deviated but not restricted? Is this the message here? 
No, no, no. I think this is different. So okay, uh, and you cannot put yeah. them together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's completely different. So when you have uh, six to twenty percent of the cases have um, severe restriction for left atrial decompression to the right atrium in the fetal life. Uh, usually you have a huge left atrium and there is no posterior deviation of the septum primum. No, this is different. So the septum is bulging to the right and the pulmonary veins are very dilated and the left atrium is, is very tense. So it's different. It's not the same. So, so it's restriction and deviation are not related. This is a different no. uh, different no, no, findings no. in hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And deviation exactly. could be part of the reduction of flow and we go by the no flow, no growth theory. Yeah. Uh, that's the one. But in the restriction, um, also if, if, if the septum becomes restricted for some reason, the flow will decrease and the development of the, of the valve will be affected, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. So the other theory, uh, of hypoplastic left heart syndrome is you have a restricted foramen ovale uh, in early gestation and you are not feeling well uh, the left chambers and you may uh, uh, end up with a hypoplastic left heart syndrome. These cases usually have a patent mitral valve and a patent uh, aortic valve um, and uh, a little LV differently from the ones that I mentioned before. Thank you so much. Um, and this is, uh, by this we reach the end of our webinar. This is the last webinar in 2021 for a fetal series. And we we're taking uh, December off um, with the um, holiday season and, and the new year and Christmas, wishing you all the best and hopefully we'll see you soon. For our audience, this is a recorded uh, um, event on the website. You can find it on the Congenital Heart Academy uh, fetal series, um, uh, 11, 11 webinars so far. Again, I'd like to thank you all. And um, hopefully from, from, the, uh, from the Brazilian group, we'll hear more and more. We're so great, grateful and we're honored to have you uh, with the Congenital Heart Academy. On behalf of Sasha, Grace, and me, I'd like to thank you again and again and wishing you a very happy new year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Rima. Thank you very much.